My name is Karen Vignari. I'm the Associate Provost for the Center for Innovation and Learning. Um, and uh, as you've already stated, I work for the University of Maryland University College, UMUC. Um, UMUC is um, a fairly unique college in the United States. Um, it is a started as an adult serving college in 1947 um, and um, has through the years become mainly an online um, institution. We still serve the military. 50% of our students are U.S. military um, and so those students often start classes um, on our bases all around the world um, and we also have some face-to-face uh, -face classes uh, for our initial courses but if you would like to complete a degree with us you will get it online. Sure, our president, President Javier Meares, um, came uh, into office a little over two years ago, almost three now, um, and um, as he began to assess the situation um, that we were facing, uh, he felt it was really important to reaffirm our mission. We have always been an open access, which for us uh, in the open world means open enrollment. Um, and I can explain more about that as we, we go forward. Um, and then uh, we really wanted to deal with this issue of cost for our students. Um, and it, it's important to understand that just because we're open access and we're low cost doesn't mean we want to, don't want to be high quality. We do want to be high quality. We believe we do offer students high quality uh, for a, a public institution. We want to continue moving all of those, uh, um, uh, that whole triangle together. So continue to lower the cost, continue to cr increase access, and continue to offer quality. Um, that decision um, by the president uh, then sort of rolled out lots of initiatives of what we could do. So one of those initiatives are around our e-resources or our move to open educational resources. So as we started um, thinking about what it is we could do, part of that was certainly move electronics. So we thought about e-books and all kinds of e-resources that are out there. But as we started that conversation, it became very clear that um, there were uh, millions of high quality OERs available that we needed to find so that they matched with our learning outcomes. And we quickly, um, last year, uh, decided that we would strive to um, serve our low cost, no cost to students um, mission in the way of choosing OER resources. In that time, we've already found um, sufficient and high quality resources for over 300 undergraduate courses. Um, and we're very, very excited by that. Um, I also shared yesterday that while the actual numbers are a little bit hard because we're estimating what students spent on textbooks previous years. Um, we think the savings are around $3 million and that as we move to 100% um, OER, or at least e-resources, um, that we will see very large savings because we do have a population of over 90,000 students. So, um, I, it, the president is an advocate of uh, lowering the cost to students. He handed it over to his, mainly the academic team, to come up with the solutions for that. The academic team, there were very strong voices on the academic team, in, including myself, um, but the provost, uh, an associate vice provost for instructional services and support, um, all of us kind of came together um, because we, we are all aware of the open movement and I myself have been involved with various projects for over a decade um, in, in being able to actually develop e-resources and work internationally and things like that. But it was a core group of champions that kind of reached this decision. Um, 
And uh, once it was reached, the academics um, really were very, very positive about it. Um, I, we are concerned, and I think it's fair to say that, you know, for all of our courses, we're concerned about how we're going to find all the OERs we need uh, based on the learning outcomes and soon um, the competencies that we are, uh, are organizing for our courses. So um, while it's not been an easy feat to actually do 300 in less than nine months, um, it's been something that has been doable for us. We have a great team of academic directors. They often hire um, either the current faculty or hire adjuncts to work with them. And then the associate deans, in this case it's just the undergraduate school, are overseeing this along with colleagues in both the instructional support and services group as well as the library. Are working together as teams of people locating resources and curating resources. They have built a, an internal website that helps um, improve the search process for um, the individuals actually looking for the resources. Uh, but I think we are struggling with how could we do this more efficiently. Um, so one of the things I hope this community um, will help with is this answer of if you become a large um, consumer of OER, how are we going to assure that that continued, continued resource is high quality? Um, and how are we going to do a better job of using, you know, search, um, speaking at a very, very large term, and discoverability of finding OER that are out there. So uh, the timeline for us is we did set 50% um, of all undergraduate courses will have um, OERs um, by this fall. Um, and then the next 50% will be in 2015. Um, and the last group um, to be completed will be the graduate courses. Um, and that schedule was reached because, again, the president really challenged us to reduce the cost for students. Um, and that challenge was by 2015, for especially for undergraduate students, that we would reduce the cost significantly of all external um, resources beyond the tuition cost that they have to pay. Uh, so that timeline is, I think, pretty aggressive. Um, and uh, we're continuing um, to work hard towards that um, timeline. And again, as I referred to earlier, we are a little bit worried about some of the courses having the relevant um, kinds of resources available to us. Now, it is an interesting question about how, where and how we're doing this. So our history was, at, and is, as an online learning university, when we got started early on, we were not an open university. We were open access. That is, if you come to us with, um, you know, having a high school degree, you can actually enroll at UMUC. Our preferred role is to work with our community colleges in, you, uh, in the Maryland and larger area. And that is, our preferred student is one that's already had a community college, um, at least credits, experience, but preferably a degree from uh, community college. Um, and that student um, typically, um, you know, typically will still need um, a lot of support. So many of our students come to us with a varied background. Um, so we're a completion to get your um, degree. So typically, because of all of the things that they come to us, we have created processes where we try to help students maximize their transcripts and what they've had in their previous experience. But our history was we created our own proprietary LMS, a learning management system. So we have a history of using proprietary tools. We're making a change um, over to uh, D2L, 
Um, so we're moving out of our own proprietary tool. But we've set up a proprietary system. We do have a content management system as well. Right now, we don't really have tools to have this repository be open. It is part of our um, thinking. I wouldn't even say we've gotten as far as developing how we're going to share um, those particular things that we're using. But it is important that we think the rest of the world knows what we've been able to identify for courses. So it's still on our list, but I don't know, I can't, I don't know when we'll get there. Um, we are working at finding the resources first, um, but back to your this third, maybe it was the third part of your question, was about remixing. So right now, we are only finding resources that are relevant and using them as is. The other associate uh, vice provost and I have talked about the fact that we would love to create a community of engaged faculty around the use of and the creation of and the remixing of uh, um, OERs. So that is actually on our list. So sometime next year, meaning sometime in the fall, we'll actually set up some pilots uh, uh, um, around that. And that gets us to um, the possibility, you know, with the various OER licenses that if we're using materials that are um, like share alike, we'll have to open up a little bit faster than, than we had planned. Um, and it really has to do with, you know, what are the appropriate tool sets, you know, for our students um, that we're trying to, to work into this path. So uh, we know it's important to let the rest of the world know what we're doing and to let them know what we've chosen. Um, and we will, <laughs> but that's not our first big issue to, to conquer. As an open access institution, again, in the United States, what, um, while some of our students are highly capable, we also serve students who have not completed either an associate's or, um, a, a, of course, a bachelor's degree, and then we have our graduate programs. And some of the cliches that, you know, are easy to describe but not necessarily the data is that they haven't always been successful at learning. They haven't learned how to learn. Uh, so our student success strategies are very, very important. Um, at this point in time, one of the things that we're also challenging ourselves is to improve our graduation rates, which means, you know, first it's course completion, then it's re-enrollment, and then it's um, evidence progress to degree, and then of course to graduation. So we have a population uh, of students um, who many of them do leave us within, and, and typically it takes our students anywhere from four to ten years because they are working adults to complete their degree. We have a population of students, um, too large of a population of students that leave us in the first two years. And that's really where our focus is, is to be able to serve those who have not yet been successful at learning in a better way. Um, and we think that commitment, um, that commitment is possible in today's world. We know so much more about the flexibility of resources. One of the reasons that we like OER is because we can easily um, find more resources. The more learning tools a student has, maybe at some point that learning process kicks in with a different kind of learning tool. Just like we're doing here, you're going to use a video oh, and maybe a transcript would have worked for somebody else or maybe it had to be an interactive simulation. So part of the process of, of improving our quality is to make sure that our instructional design process is what it needs to be to help more students be successful. And along with that, we're thinking of, and again, we hope that this move to OER has made this process easier. We're thinking about, you know, a big use of adaptive learning, particularly for those students um, who have been less successful in their, um, uh, in their, you know, uh, plan in order to get a degree themselves. And, and what adaptive learning is to us 
is that. It will give the student who is really frustrated by, I don't understand and I need more feed, immediate feedback. So um, we've worked with the Open UK before on the Bridge to Success uh, program. That's the kind of work that we need to keep doing here at University of Maryland, University College. We need to really focus on those students who have motivation, who have grit, who have aptitude, and making sure somehow the process doesn't fail them the way it has in the past. So we're looking forward to doing that and helping our students a lot more with that. Yeah. So, um, because we're such a large scale um, institution, we have a textbook purchasing department. Um, and so all of that information has been recorded in prior years. So we're using the, the savings as a calculation based on what was paid in previous years for that particular course. Um, and again, as I explained yesterday, we do know that less and less students were buying those textbooks, but our calculation is based on the price of the textbook that was originally ordered for the class multiplied by the number of people that were enrolled in that uh, particular course. Um, and I think that's, that's a fair way, it's probably not 100% accurate, but knowing which students would purchase the book and is, is a little bit harder. We, I mean, we all have seen the statistics that anywhere from 15 to 50% are not purchasing the book. Um, and beyond the fact that we're saving students, we also look at this as um, a, an integrated pedagogy pedagogical value for our students and, and what that means to us is um, our students will leave us um, with a degree and they will be out in the real world as we academics like to call it and when they are looking for resources that will help them solve a business problem then what happens is they, um, they need to be able to assess resources on their own. So this idea of finding resources that are freely available um, and making sure students understand that they can find those same kinds of resources at their workplace is also a really important transition for our students as they move into the next phase of their work life. Um, so we think that um, mirroring and um, modeling that behavior becomes really, really important. So that's a value that I don't know how to quantify at this point in time, but we think that process is really important. And while I haven't done this yet, but again, uh, working with the OER Research Hub and uh, Dr. Farrell and yourself, uh, we're very interesting in measuring impact in different ways. Um, so hopefully we'll get our 50% and we can talk about how to do some different kinds of research on that impact factor. I'd have to say no at this point in time. We, we really haven't reached out um, to ask students um, about um, the impact of having OER. I would think that, again, um, not only working with you at Open UK, but probably being able to pull some of our own data about downloads and uh, things being pulled out of the learning management system will also be a way that we can kind of think about impact. Um, but I, right now we haven't done any surveys of students, you know, focused on did you, what did you think of the resources or anything like that. So um, that comes next. Yeah, so, so the impact I think on um, colleagues, staff, and faculty throughout um, UMUC has been a very positive one. Now, I would say that people are concerned, you know. We did the first 300, and again, I don't want to... I don't want to leave the impression that that was all easy because it, it wasn't easy, but it was doable. And uh, we are worried about 
the additional courses, like how much work will it take finding or perhaps even creating the right OER. But in that concern part, it's the concern about matching the um, OER to the learning outcomes that are needed for that particular course or work. Um, and, and in that, though, we're creating this whole um, new, you know, focus around student savings, putting the students first. I mean, that's kind of brought our colleagues together. Uh, it's not necessarily the mission of OER that's brought us together, but this idea that this is something we can change. Right? And that has kind of empowered people uh, to keep working at this, to keep doing it, to try and figure it out. In fact, our, our um, acting undergraduate dean was saying, I think we're going to actually focus on some of the courses we're worried about the most first. Um, now that we've gotten so many done, instead of waiting until the very end. And, and I'm hopeful, and again, this is me speaking and not necessarily you at MUC, I'm hopeful as those tasks uh, uh, quickly become apparent what they are, that we might do something um, that's even more different for us, is crowdsourcing or call for OER in certain areas. Uh, I'm also hopeful I went to a wonderful presentation um, at this, this conference on linked open data and semantic web searching um, because I suspect we haven't found all of the OER yet um, and that is an area I think all of us are going to need a lot more help in. But I, I think it's really been a very positive impact on uh, staff and, and faculty and academic directors around this. Okay, we can change something for our students. We can make it a little bit cheaper for you to come to college and get your degree. It, it doesn't change the, the, the public tuition price, but it certainly has changed the, the fact that you can actually make a change for somebody in an institution and do it relatively quickly does have a positive impact on both staff and faculty. So that, that's, um, that's a really, really good question. Um, and for us, I think it's important to understand uh, a lot of people um, started their missions as an institution uh, very differently. So at, at UMUC, as I've already explained, we were a continuing education unit um, and back in 1947 and we've always served the military. So it wasn't really designed as an open mission other than we were open access. So as long as you had gotten that high school degree or in the US we can also call them GEDs, um, you were, you could apply, you could enroll and you had a chance at getting a college degree. In a lot of places that doesn't happen. So that is our foundation in openness. And our secondary foundation is to really grow the use of um, OERs um, at, for our students, the use of them in teaching, the use of them in applying to our next roles, I mean our next um, designs around competency-based education and uh, adaptive learning. Um, from the expectation of openness as a concept more generally, and this would be speaking as myself, you know, um, Karen Minyari, the not the associate provost. So as a person who's been involved in this field, I think it's very important for education to become much more transparent. The more transparent we become about the learning process, and part of this is being uh, presented to us through a lot of learner analytics and information, but the more transparent we become about learning and what's actually happening, the faster I think we can figure out how to help more people learn quicker and at a, a cheaper price. So unless we have openness that includes that sharing of how people are studying, what they're studying, what kinds of resources are they using, and that process, it's going to be very difficult for us to figure out what's the design for a student, what kind of personalization do they need, uh, what does the data tell us about what we need to change. Uh, when somebody enters our institution, 
um, as a UMUC, we can't say, you're, we don't say to them, you don't have a high enough GPA, you don't have a high enough SAT, you don't have these scores. We say to them, let us help you. If you are, going, are motivated and willing to try, hopefully we can help you. And for us, that understanding of what's happening to that particular student becomes really important for our, our long-term success as a university, uh, but I think for education's long-term success. We have so many people in this entire world uh, that have yet to get any uh, kind of education, and then on top of that, a college degree. And um, I know the Open UK that y you guys are facing some cost increases in college, and the same for us. We've seen a huge increases uh, in cost for college, and the rest of the world is not going to be able to afford even what we've been able to afford at this point in time. So we have to actually get to a place where uh, this transparency helps us lower the cost. Um, and continues the quality. So. Yeah, l let me just add, I, I, um, again, in, in today's um, uh, conference, we heard from um, a data scientist, um, and um, I, I really do think we need people um, who are um, incredibly intelligent and understand data to help us work in the OER world. We really need um, this presentation again that I referred to earlier about linked open data and semantic web. We really need a step up in how we're, uh, how those people can help us do much better searching, um, but also uh, searching uh, through the competency that is uh, a particular uh, um, a course might be challenging a student to actually achieve. So if we move to this world of competencies, we have a structure. We probably have something similar to a taxonomy. We need people who understand that process of looking for data. OER is data. And we need to, to take that next step. And, and we need, I think, in order for people to become to, to actually do what UMUC is doing. We need to change um, the work and curation element uh, from an individual workload to tools. And so I think we need a lot of really important people in engineering, and I, I shouldn't say just important people, really smart people in engineering and computer science and you know process engineers to help us think through what are the tool set. All of the OER are sitting on the web. They should be accessible to us in some ways. And so being able to do that and then reflect on them, are those still current? Are those, do they need to be updated? Systems that will tell us things like, all right, that resource is now three years old, is that still the one that you want to use? So I think we need systematized OER processes um, so more of us can start to actually be big users um, and not just creators of OER.